We're good. We're back up and we're live. All right. So we are back on the live stream and I were on the Facebook page and I was asking for an interest in prayer for one of our elders, Bob Alley, uh, who was in the ER yesterday, not with anything respiratory related or coronavirus is my understanding, but still we we're asking for prayers and also for uh, Cherion Plamudel, who is uh, attending here. His wife, Ash, is a member here. Both are medical doctors. Cherion's actually an ER doc, and so he is very much on the first line of response. And we have other members here um, who are uh, medical practitioners and so, and fire uh, response people and uh, EMTs, and so we are asking for prayers. In fact, let's begin with that and begin our time together by going to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Lord, we are grateful to you for every blessing that you have bestowed upon us. We are thankful for the fact that we can spend this time together, even digitally, that we might encourage one another, that we might listen to your word. We're especially mindful now, Father, of those that we've mentioned and many, many others who are in the direct path of this epidemic that we face, and we pray that you will give them strength and courage, protect them, and help us to be supportive of them as they do their very important jobs. For all the blessings that you bestow upon us and for the, the sacrifice of your son who we meet today and, and gather even digitally to remember, uh, we, uh, we express our thanks and our gratitude for all that you have done for us. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we make this prayer. Amen. I'm told that we may not be able to see the PowerPoint, so I'm going to step a little bit to the side and see if I can not at least uh, do that. Pete, is there just no way? There's just no way. Okay. You can see it a little bit, but that's just about the best we're okay. going to do for Okay, well, let's open our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 10, which is a text that I want to begin with. I like to begin with the words of our Lord. Uh, sometimes, like the disciples, I go everywhere preaching the word, but at least we want to begin there. And in Matthew 10, we read where someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? I'm using the New American Standard Bible this morning. And Jesus said to them, why are you asking me about what is good? Which might be a strange response, but then the Lord directs our attention to this. There is only one who is good. But he adds, if you wish to enter life, keep the commandments. Now, there is more to that conversation that is not directly what I want us to focus on today, but I want us to think about the goodness of God, even in the midst of trying times. Uh, there's a common phrase, and in fact, I've titled the lesson, God is good all the time, which is a common phrase that you sometimes hear almost in a call and response sort of thing. Someone who knows the drill, so to speak, will say God is good and the response comes from an audience or from another person in the conversation all the time. And that is certainly true. I can't think of a better text. And in fact, it may be the one that Jesus had in mind when he responded, there is but one who is good. And that is in Psalm 145. And so as we often do, I want us to turn to the Psalms. Jesus quoted the Psalms a great deal during his lifetime. Obviously he was intimately familiar with them. But we read in Psalm 145 and verse 9 exactly what our Lord said while he was upon the earth. The Lord, Yahweh, is good to all. If you're reading from a translation that has Lord in capital letters, that's simply a typographical way or a translational way to say this is the, talking about Yahweh, God of heaven and earth, the God of the universe. And his mercies are over all his works is what the Bible tells us. And so what I want to do for just a few moments this morning is to walk through Psalm 145. It's a very simple kind of lesson. There is a call to praise in the first seven verses. Uh, the psalm actually breaks down very easily, and in some uh, versions it's even uh, typographically set in this way, followed by what we might call three clusters which form the content of our praise. And they deal, after this initial call to praise that we read about in the first seven verses in which the God's characteristics are extolled, but then more specifically, his character and his kingdom, what makes him good and what, what, why we should be subject to him and citizens of his kingdom. And then secondly, his care and kindness, as the text says for all. That's the section from verses 8 to 13 that deal with the text in verse 9 that we're using. And then finally in the last section, 17 to 21 of Psalm 145, his compassion, his care, and his keeping for us. 
And so if you'll read with me from Psalm 145, the call to praise, if you will. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. And then there's a generational aspect to this in verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works, I will meditate. Men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully your righteousness. Now, if we read and just take at face value what the text is saying without uh, doing a deep dive anywhere, although we'll note a couple of things as we move through the text, every day I will bless you. Our blessing of the Lord, our blessings come every day. God gives us daily blessings. He grants us daily food and all of the other things that he showers upon us which we too often take for granted, maybe until we're in a time like we're in where we're not able to do common and ordinary things that we recognize as blessings, but, but simply take for granted. And so as God blesses us every day, this text says, I will bless you. I will give praise to your name. I will praise your name forever and ever. And then in verse 3, a text that again uh, resounds throughout the Bible, including in the New Testament, uh, great is the Lord and highly to be praised. Hymns have used this kind of phraseology for years. His greatness is unsearchable. If you'll be turning to Romans chapter 11 and at the end of the chapter, Paul utters an exclamation there uh, that I want us to look at in just a moment. But I came across a quotation that had been in kind of the deep background of my mind, but in, pre in preparation for this lesson, it's actually from Albert Einstein, if you can see at least a part of the screen. Uh, Einstein is considered by many, of course, the person of the century as time had it, and a name that everybody uh, probably knows unless they've been under a rock somewhere. In an interview that he gave back in 1930, almost a century ago, he was asked a question, are you an atheist or a pantheist or what are you? And he says, your question is the most difficult in the world. It is not a question that I can answer simply with yes or no. I am not an atheist. I do not know if I can define myself as a pantheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. And that's the point that he adds to by saying, then may I not reply with a parable? And his parable is this. The human mind, no matter how highly trained, cannot grasp the universe. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library whose walls are covered to the ceiling with books in many different tone, tongues. The child knows that someone must have written those books, but the child does not know who or how. The child does not understand the languages in which they were written. If it's possible to see the screen, I've got a picture, actually this is Trinity uh, College Library in Dublin. Uh, I use it because I recently saw an, an atheist meme that talked about how ignorant uh, Christians sometimes are, and I thought it ironic that they used for the meme of the library at Trinity College, Dublin. But the analogy that Einstein uses here is interesting. He says, as he continues, the child notes a definite plan in the arrangement of the books. Now, the picture here is of the Library of Congress, my favorite library in the world, actually. But he says he detects a mysterious order, which, it does, which the child does not comprehend, but only dimly suspects. That, Einstein says, it seems to me, is the attitude of the human mind even the greatest and most cultured toward God. We see a universe marvelously arranged, obeying certain laws, but we understand those laws only dimly. Our limited minds cannot grasp the mysterious force that sways the constellations. Now, Einstein might have been channeling the Apostle Paul here, actually, and so if you'll tell, come with me now to Romans 11 at verse 33, which we mentioned before, where Paul exclaims, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? And even here, the, poet, the, the author, Paul, is quoting uh, from the psalm, excuse me, from Isaiah in this case. Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back again? 
For from him and through him and to him are all things, and to him be the glory forever. And even though Paul is quoting here not from the Psalms, he might as well have been looking at this text uh, that we're looking at as we come back now to Psalm 145. God's ways are unsearchable. And we come to verse 4, and again, I emphasize the point that this is something that for Christians especially, for those in God's kingdom, for those who experience his covenant love, uh, that has to be passed down from generation to generation. One generation shall praise your works to another, the text says, and shall declare your mighty acts. If we do not do this, of course, it's quite possible that, at least in some areas of the world and for our families, uh, that the faith indeed could die out. And all of us have observed that kind of thing happening. We need to be careful to make sure that our children and our grandchildren, uh, those with whom we have direct contact and maybe the most influence over anybody in the earth, that we transmit this knowledge and tell of his greatness, as verse 6 tells us. We should speak of the power of his awesome acts and tell of your greatness to eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness. In the midst of crisis, and remember that this, this is a psalm attributed to David, who had experienced all kinds of trauma and natural uh, lions and bears even in his day to day, uh, working as a shepherd and then uh, in ascending to the throne and coming to the kingdom, the rivalry with Saul who sought to kill him uh, despite David's good intentions, all of these things. And even late in life, David faced, because of his own sin, uh, the prospect of pestilence, something maybe like uh, an epidemic like we face today. And in the midst of all of this, David is reminding us that we should praise God for his greatness. But I come now to the second part, uh, the, the sort of second section of the praiseworthiness of God. And we, we find an interesting reference here as we read from verse 8. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in loving kindness, as this version has it. The, the chesed, the, the covenant love, the everlasting love uh, of God to those who are his people. The Lord is good to all. His mercies are over all his works. We are reminded in verse 9, our Lord says he sends the rain on the just and the unjust. But there's a special sense in which those who are in God's covenant uh, have both obligations and blessings. The, the text actually here is calling our attention back to this paramount text that's quoted all over the Old Testament. In Exodus 34, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness, is our word again, and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands and forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. So the idea of forgiveness, the idea of compassion, the idea of loving kindness, of Hasebi's covenant love uh, and his willingness to forgive. And why must he forgive? Because we have sinned. And the text says, yet, flipping the coin, he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. And so we have to recall that God indeed, while a just and merciful God, bestows blessings upon all of us, particularly on those who are in his covenant in terms of spiritual blessings, and yet he will not leave the guilty unpunished. Uh, I don't know if you can see the screen at this point, but I will remind us that, and maybe we can focus on it for a moment, how widespread this idea is in the Old Testament. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, very quickly, this is not a sermon I want to, to re-preach, we've talked about this before, but it's appealed to by Moses himself later in the book of Numbers, and it's quoted all over the Psalms in many places, including the Psalm we're looking at this morning, Psalm 145. Uh, and indeed, if you back up a little bit, Psalm 136 is totally dedicated to this celebration of the loving kindness, the chesed, the, the, the covenant grace, of the covenant love of God, of Yahweh. Um, in fact, it becomes a stumbling block to some people. If you look at Jonah chapter 4, Jonah complains of God's grace. Uh, in fact, that's the reason that he fled from Nineveh. He said, I knew that if these people heard the word and repented, I knew you would forgive them. And that's something that Jonah, as a uh, myopic, limited human being, was not interested in doing. Uh, Nehemiah quotes the text in chapter 9, uh, which is a, a fascinating study in its own right. But I simply want to make the point as we come back now to Psalm 145 that this is not an isolated idea or text. It is in some ways the very core of what even the Old Testament is about, this idea that there's no grace 
in the Old Testament, grace and truth came by Moses. And just as there is truth uh, in the Old Covenant in the Mosaic Law, so there is grace there as well, even though it is magnified and overflowing in the New Covenant that God has established uh, in these times. We come now back to the section in chapter one, Psalm 145, uh, verses 8 to 13. The Lord is gracious and merciful. And then we get this section on the Lord's kingdom and power and glory, a phrase that resonates because of its usage in the book of Revelation and, and even in some versions in the words of our Lord. Look with me at verses 11 and 12. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom. While we're praising God, we need to also emphasize the glory of his kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Whatever governments may do, whoever rules in the affairs of men, and we're reminded in Romans 13 that we're to be subject to the powers that be. And that was written, of course, at a time when uh, Caesars ruled the empire and had direct control over the affairs of Christians, and yet Christians are instructed to be in subjection to the powers that be because theoretically they do that which is good uh, for those who are Christians. But the point here is that despite whoever rules in the, the governments of men, uh, the, the dominion of the Lord is everlasting and his kingdom shall endure. And then we come to the section that's the third part of it uh, in which God's care and kindness for us is emphasized. And that's, I think, critically important, particularly in these times. If you'll read with me, the Lord sustains all who fall and he raises up all who are bowed down. In verse 15, the eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to who? To all who call upon him and to all who call upon him in truth, the psalmist tells us. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will hear their cry and save them. The Lord keeps all who love him. But then again, as we saw in our text in Exodus 34, but the wicked he will destroy. And so he satisfies our daily needs, the desires that we have. It does not mean that we never become sick. It doesn't mean that we need to be foolhardy uh, about our health or well-being to take reasonable kinds of precautions. Uh, another lesson that we may talk about next week, God, of course, is the author of, of the idea of quarantine. If you look back at the Leviticus, at the holiness code, actually, or parts of the Old Testament that deal uh, with, with holiness, uh, that's one of the things that, uh, that is stipulated, but that's a lesson for another time. The point here is that God satisfies the desire of every living thing. He hears the cries of those who fear him. But the psalmist also adds again in verse 20, the wicked he will destroy. And then at the close of the psalm, he emphasizes this again. My mouth will speak the praise of Yahweh, the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Now, there is abundant reason, even in the midst of crisis, for us to, to praise God and to be willing to offer the sacrifice of praise unto his glorious name. And as we read through this psalm, and we see the various, not only the call to praise and to worship, but also these three clusters as the text is divided, uh, more or less into paragraphs or, or combinations of thought, God's character and his kingdom. God is good all the time. And his care and kindness for us are emphasized going all the way back to the establishment even of the Mosaic Covenant and the announcement of the covenant love that God has for those who are in his care and his compassion and keeping even for the entire creation, for those who may not even be in a right relationship with God. Now, we usually extend an invitation at this time, and I'm going to invite you to visit again the Downers Grove uh, page. And in fact, if you will visit not only the Facebook page, I understand we're trying to get this and maybe some other lessons. Last week's lesson is already, I think, on our YouTube channel. And so we'll be circulating some information about that and what we might be able to do uh, in this time of crisis where we're not able to assemble together uh, physically. Uh, so you can check our YouTube page. If you go to the Downers Grove website, uh, dgcoc.com, uh, you will find, uh, we probably should repackage these or, or rebrand them as podcasts, but they're um, uh, recordings of dozens of lessons in the past uh, pick one that you have not heard. If you were absent one Sunday or if there's one you'd like to hear again, 
Uh, there are some of the sermons of, that I've done. There are sermons by other visiting preachers who have been here through the years. And so it's an abundant resource, particularly at this time, uh, where, uh, where we're not able to meet together. And we'll be announcing both on our Facebook page and also on the YouTube channel other ways that you might be able to get biblical information as we try to grow these sites. And so that is the invitation for this morning. We thank you very much for joining us. Stay safe. Thank you.